the text part in. Um, I don't know if you have the full empathy, practical innovation, theory, leading in different aspects of America, it's really interesting research like topics. Uh, so now we'll be talking about uh, broad intersection to garbage and paper analysis. Um, so kind of you. All right, so thanks to the organizers for having me. Thanks for all of you for being here. Um, so I wanted to give a very introductory, very pedagogical talk, and I find the best way to do that is via Blackboard Talks. So I'm going to write on this iPad. It's going to be a bit of a blend of pre-prepared material and derivations on the fly. So that means I need some participation from you, particularly if I make a sign error or a factor of two error that's obvious, you should let me know. Um, and also, since it is introductory, some of you may get bored. There are things you already know. So don't be afraid when you're getting bored to ask a mean question. And don't be afraid to ask a question, even if you're not getting bored, just because I'm not being clear. Uh, if I don't know the answer, I can appeal to my team of gravitational wave experts here. And uh, if not, we'll just take it offline. So a quick overview, broad brush picture. Uh, Maria already discussed sort of aspects of this picture before, but I'll just return to it now to ground us in sort of the workflow of data analysis. Um, First of all, it's worth mentioning that there are multiple source types, and this talk is going to focus in particular on gravitational waves from compact binaries, which is the in-spiral limit gravitational waves, and then they eventually coalesce together, merge together. Um, there are also searches for continuous waves, which can be emitted from neutron stars with some sort of non-exosymmetric quadrupolar deviation. Uh, there's also stochastic gravitational waves, which are from the unresolved background of astrophysical binary black hole mergers, but also potentially, maybe, from primordial sources near the universe. And there's also searches, as Maria mentioned, which are less modeled than the compact binary search, which are there to sort of try to discover the unexpected, or potentially, because as I'll discuss in this talk, the binary searches are modeled, find those systems where our models aren't good enough necessarily at this moment but where we might still have a nearby strong signal. Okay. But the searches that have found by far, well, really all of the gravitational wave signals so far are the compact binary searches. So we can focus on those. So gravitational wave modeling plays an essential role in the entire data analysis pipeline for these compact binaries. So we've already had two great talks giving a full overview of different aspects of gravitational wave models. So I'll take for granted that we have a way of predicting the gravitational waves plus and cross polarization emitted from a system at some location in the sky relative to a gravitational wave detector, given the binaries parameters. So we can do that. Those waves imprint themselves, they're projected onto the actual detector in the form of a single time series the strain, the dimensionless strain, HT, which is formed of summing the polarizations together with some projection factors. These factors depend on the location of the binary in the sky and also its orientation around the angle of the line of sight. And just because there's an imprint of this on the detector doesn't mean that that's necessarily easy for us to record accurately. So it's actually, there's a fairly complicated and sophisticated method of control of this detector and calibration of the strain signal in the detector in order to find the output the delta L, the change in length between the two perpendicular arms of the detector, which is induced by the real gravitational wave strength. If we divide that by the length of the detectors, this gives us what we're usually calling H of T, which is actually a process calibrated H of T. And that calibration process itself has some inaccuracies. We try to do our best to understand the uncertainties in that process and account for them. After that, there's often a set of sort of noise subtraction steps. So there are some features of noise in the detector that we actually know where they're coming from, sometimes because we put them in ourselves in order to calibrate the detector, other times just because we can measure other device, other uh, signals in the detector in order to see what is pushing on this delta L. And this, these can often be subtracted coherently. So there's a little bit of a pre-data processing step of noise subtraction. And this then provides us with the strain signal, the H of T, that is used for gravitational wave searches. So the next stage is the gravitational wave searches are run on the data, and I will discuss these today. And these searches identify potential candidate signals in the data and assign them some significance. How likely is it that this is a real detection as opposed to just environmental instrumental noise? The results of those searches are then fed to parameter estimation. The thing is, these searches might identify candidate 
And it might give you a rough picture of what its properties are, but it does not give you a fine grain picture of what its properties are. And the physics that go into these searches is limited compared to how well we actually know how to model the gravitational signal. So we need to do a second step if we want to measure the properties of the signal. And that's known as parameter estimation. It provides us with our best understanding of what the masses, the spins, the sky location were of the binary that produced the signal that was identified in the searches. On top of that, there's a fairly large effort of detector characterization. These are uh, teams of people that investigate the properties of the detector data and the properties of detector noise. They identify instrumental transients I'll talk about in a little while. And this feeds back into the searches and the parameter estimation in order to help us do a better job of accounting for unexpected sources of noise when we do the searches and when we do the parameter estimation. The result of parameter estimation is a collection of candidates plus their properties. And this is what feeds into all of the scientific uh, applications of gravitational waves that the LIGO Proto collaborations do, that other collaborations, other astronomers, other people want to do. And that includes inferring the properties of the total population of these binaries, testing our theories of relativity by modifying our models and repeating some aspects of this chain, doing cosmology with gravitational waves, and on and on and on down to, for example, trying to figure out the equation of state of neutron stars. Any questions about this picture overall before we All right. So let's get started. The way to understand this, oh, sorry, that was actually, I gave myself plenty of room in case there were questions, and there weren't. So here we are. Now, in order to understand this, I'd like to start with noise and describing for you the easy search challenge. From this, we're gonna be able to understand a lot of the tools and techniques we use in gravitational data analysis. So this is that raw detected data I mentioned, that delta O over L. And there's a signal in here, and it is not this wildly oscillating sinusoidal thing. This is noise, okay? This is a sequence of random oscillations. Some you can see are very large amplitude and relatively low frequency with periods of a fraction of a second. And then if you zoom in closely, there's some fuzz on these curves. That's much higher frequency noise. It's superimposed on this. So it's a fairly complicated set of noise going on here. And there's a screaming loud gravitational wave hiding in here. Okay, so what do you do? Well, first of all, you try to handle this noise by putting all of the different instances of time on equal footing. This is known as whitening, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in a second. But it basically creates an uncorrelated noise process instead of this heavily correlated oscill oscillatory noise process. And you get this. And it's still not obvious that there's a gravitational wave in here. Okay? Then you cheat. And you know where the gravitational wave is, and you apply a bandpass filter in order to cut away the low and the high frequency noise and concentrate on the region where the, the gravitational wave signal is pushing on the data. And then finally, you can see the 914, the first detection of gravitational waves, which is a very loud amplitude wave. Yes? Oh, so the, 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 uh, the over amplitude of the green or the white green. Uh, is it not it? Yes, that's a great question. So um, I'm not going to talk a lot about the technical details of Fourier transforms, but in fact, the nitty gritty of Fourier transforms is a nightmare that we tackle and struggle with every day. And so if I have a real segment of data and I want to manipulate it in the frequency domain, I've got a Fourier transform it. It's a finite length of data, so I have to do a discrete Fourier transform. And if both ends are not naturally zero, then that's not going to be periodic, which is the assumption of the discrete Fourier transform. You have a perfectly periodic signal beyond your domain. And so what you typically have to do is you have to force the data to be zero at the ends by applying some sort of smooth window function that zeroes it at the ends. It doesn't damage too much the data in between. And that then you can Fourier transform. And these kinds of technical steps of windowing adding extra zeros to your data stream to maintain the right levels of resolution and so on, will often result in these kinds of artificial features at the end where you have lost some information at the ends. Any other questions about that? Yeah, but then do you use overlapping segments so you don't lose? Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's a separate issue, but you, for a single segment of data, like one we want to do parameter estimation on, you just make sure that these point, these areas that are affected are at the edges, or else you have to account for the fact that there's some areas that are affected by not analyzing. In terms of doing a PSD, you're going to do multiple overlapping segments, which I'll mention. Maybe I don't know if everybody is, is aware of our general PSD. I mean, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm going to define it. 
Okay, sorry. I apologize for the jargon. Power spec is messy. I'm going to define that. Okay, but this is cheating. You never do this with the data. And that famous that famous picture you've seen of 5914 oscillating OA is kind of a lie because that's never been that's never used in data analysis. Okay, this step is this wiping step, but this final band passing step is not how we analyze the data. Okay, it's just good for illustration. Okay, so the challenge, the easy search challenge is. When this tiny signal is right here in this data, how do we find it and how do we analyze it? Okay. And I'm going to talk about that here. First, just so they're on the paper, we have some Fourier transform dimensions. We have the minus sign when we go into the frequency domain, the plus sign when we go into the time domain. No factors are too high because we're actually doing frequency transformations. And it is a very important fact that I will abuse regularly that if I take a real time stream that's and Fourier transform, and of course, this Fourier transform is not real, it's complex, but there's some redundant information. The complex conjugate of the Fourier transform is has this property that its complex conjugate is equal to the negative frequency component. So there's a redundancy between positive and negative frequencies. All right. So with the conventions out of the way, let's look at our assumptions. Our assumptions are that the data is going to be composed of some real signal plus some noise process. This noise process is a random process, and we're going to need to assume some properties of it to make any progress at all. And the properties we're going to assume is that it's stationary and ergodic. Okay, stationary just means that there's no preferred time. Okay, all the correlations I make between different times of this random process depend only on the distance between the two points in time not on the exact time we're talking about. So it doesn't matter if it's Tuesday or Wednesday. What matters is if I do a correlation between the noise or the day's worth of separation. Ergodic is a technical assumption that's actually quite important in practice. Ergodic systems are the ones that explore the whole of phase space that's available to them over time. And ergodic systems allow you to trade time integrals for spatial integrals, integrals over phase space instead of long time integrals or vice versa. We need ergodicity because we're going to take a bunch of ensemble averages when we talk about stuff, and we can't realize a real ensemble average where we let a process run many, many times in parallel universes and then average them together. What we can do is for an ergodic process, we can take a long time average, and that's equivalent to the ensemble average. All right. So with a stationary process, oh, we'll also do zero mean, but this is still totally general. We're just saying that the ensemble average of the noise itself is zero at any given time. That's not, that is not an assumption because what you can do is if you have a non-zero mean process, you just compute the mean and subtract it. Just a question. So I can see how you can test stationarity, but how do you test ergodicity? I don't think you can test ergodicity because by definition, we can't actually take a real ensemble average. We have to build a sequence of identical LIGOs and then run identical experiments and then do this. So this is just going to be a different kind of statement. We're just going to make the statement that we can take expectation values by taking multiple segments in time and averaging them together. Okay? And if that fails, that's still what we're doing. Right? There's no other choice. <laughs> There's no other well, choice. There will be an optimal window where which you know the detector is more restable. I mean, you don't have a job every week because you don't know. Yeah, so that's this idea of stationarity, and I'll come back to that. I keep saying I'll come back to it, so clearly I'm not going to come back to everything. So, um, <laughs> but ergodicity is kind of like a formal thing that you have to prove mathematically for very special systems. Uh, and so I don't know if you can really prove ergodicity for well, ergodicity. people do that same argument. There's you can. Instantiate many experiments. In, in what? Can you do that? Sort of. So, you know, that's still arguing that, yeah, so if you could repeat the experiment exactly over and over again, uh, then you can test this, right? But, uh, you know, I think we kind of do repeat, we can kind of can show this ergodic in a sense, in that. If I run the detector one day and another, and you kind of account for these day to day variations, the noise still has the same properties from day to day. So that is helpful, but formally speaking, proving a, 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 a dynamical system is ergodic is hard and has to be done mathematically by understanding the dynamics. You know, in practice, the power spectrum test is the average over hours. No, it depends on the it depends on the application. Let me 
Uh, let me come back to that. Remind me if I don't come back to that in your like two minutes. Okay, so what's one property then that we commonly think about? Well, those of you familiar with cosmology and, and conformal field theory might like correlators. And so one thing we can do is we can do the two-point correlator between the noise and itself at some lag tau. And of course, the correlator can only depend on tau because it's a stationary, because it's a stationary. So this is the autocorrelation. And this is one of the things that describes some of the properties of the noise, but for general noise processes, not all of the properties of the noise. By definition, the zero lag autocorrelation is the variance of the noise, it's sigma squared. Okay, so that's one way to think about what this autocorrelation is telling us. And then the other thing we see with the autocorrelation function is, generally speaking, it must fall off in time. So it starts out at lag zero with sigma squared, and then it's going to fall off over some characteristic amount of time that we call the autocorrelation time or the autocorrelation length. This has to be true because in order for the thing to be uh, stationary, it's got to eventually forget where it was at some time before. And that's going to result in a loss of correlation between the data at different times. It doesn't need to be always positive, right? Uh, no, it doesn't need to be always positive. You're right. I think this is what it looks like for something like shock noise or something. Don't recall. Good point. Okay, so the, there's something the Wiener Kinch team theorem, which tells us that there is an interesting object that's related to the Fourier transform of this autocorrelation function. The real part of the Fourier transform of this autocorrelation function is the power spectral density. I find that to be not the clearest way to see what the power spectral density is. So instead, I like to think about the power spectral density in terms of correlations of the Fourier domain components of the noise. So if I take the noise at one frequency and correlate it with the noise at another frequency, and I didn't say this, I should have, no one said anything. These brackets mean an ensemble average. Okay, these are the ensemble averages. Okay. So if I take the noise at different frequencies and I ensemble average them for a stationary process, so all of these kinds of processes sound pretty normal to us. The neat thing is that this is equal to one half this Sn of f, this power spectral density, times the delta function at the front end step. Okay, so while the noise stationary process is correlated in the time domain, it is not correlated in the frequency domain. And that's why we love to work in the frequency domain. The noise is complicated in the time domain, but it's simple in the frequency domain. It's completely characterized by this PSD. So this is called the power spectral density or PSD. Technically speaking, this is the one-sided PSD. Okay, and one-sided is just uh, no matter whether or not you're using this factor as one half. Okay. Uh, if it was two-sided, you wouldn't use it. And by de by conventions, we use the two the one-sided PSD migrant. Sorry, that so the first one, as you said, it could pass under the assumption of regularity, is an iterating time and time don't uh, the time interval. The second one, you're iterating let, let me come back to that. Um by really am coming back to this. That's a good question. So um I haven't yet used ergodicity. We're assuming we can really do these, oh. these things. And I'll, I'll talk about the practicalities actually just after I talk about units. So clearly I'm a little ahead of the lecture. So I can draw that. Um, so I just like to note that units are worth looking at and we need, and it's nice to have a physical interpretation of what this PSD is telling you. And then I'll talk about how to calculate it. So the units of the noise are unitless because we're talking about dimensionless strength. But notice that that means that the units of their Fourier transform are not dimensionless. The Fourier transform introduces uh, units, and so the units of the noise in frequency domain have units of time or one over hertz. The PSD is also going to be defined as the Fourier transform of this correlator function, or, or else uh, you can look at this. This has units of time squared. The delta function also has units of time. These delta functions have units. And so you realize that the PSD also has units of one per hertz. And that's a little weird, but that's just the way it is. Okay, so it's a little weird that the, the units of the power spectral density are one over hertz for units of time. Okay, now the way to interpret the PSD is that the root mean squared RMS fluctuations in the noise in the noise process, if I measure it at some frequency using some interval of time t. So I take 10 seconds of data and at uh, 20 hertz, 
I want to figure out what was the RMS fluctuation of the noise in that particular frequency range. Well, having taken only a limited amount of time, it turns out that our resolution is set by how much time you take. The more time you take, the finer your frequency res resolution, right? It's just the Heisenberg uncertainty relation. So the resolution of a finite stretch of data, delta F is one over the duration. And it turns out that the RMS fluctuations, N RMS, is equal to the square root of the PSC. So I have to give it the right units by multiplying it by delta F or dividing it by the duration. So this is the way to think about the PSD. It is almost, okay, this, the variance, right? Its square root is almost the standard deviation of the, no, of the frequency domain noise, except they have to also multiply by a factor of frequency. And that's gonna be the size of the frequency bin that you've used in your Fourier transfer. Any questions? Yes. Well, not, well, not really, no, no because the, the inclusion point is the n tilde, the amplitude of n tilde scales is the square root of b. So if, if you really take infinite amount of time, the amplitude of square root of t, the amplitude of n tilde goes to infinity, but it's really n tilde divided by square root, which is significant for a detector. That's what this Yeah, yeah. so it is, the, it is the PSD that matters for all practical purposes, right? So there's nothing wrong with this. It's just that if you wanted to define this measurement process of measuring the RMS fluctuations in a noise that have been sure. as I increase my resolution, as you increase the resolution, you're going to lose power in that bin because the thing gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So there's nothing wrong with the idea that this particular thing goes to zero. I'm just trying to provide some intuition. But as Ricardo was saying, everything that matters is actually the PSD. This is the thing that as I take Del, as I take t infinite, this is the thing that matters. This is the thing that stays finite and tells us about the next process. Any other comments or questions? Okay, practicalities. So in practice, we can't compute this thing. It requires an ensemble average, right? So in practice, what we do is we would take a stretch of data, of data, we set this by the resolution we'd like to achieve, and then we take a discrete Fourier transform of it to get one estimate of this autocorrelation, right? So I can take the discrete Fourier transform of n, multiply it by its complex conjugate, and that's one realization of this random correlate of this random multiplication. And then I repeat. I repeat and average them. And this is known as the Welch method. There's a few caveats. The true Welch method, you have to take overlapping segments for the reason Ricardo was saying, we lose, we lose things at the edges. So you actually want to take overlapping segments to help correct that. And usually when we average, you could just do a direct average. I could sum these, I could sum these estimates for the PSD together. Uh, but actually we usually try to take the mean in a, the median in every given frequency then to help cull outliers. Okay, so it's kind of this weird thing. Let's say we wanted to do, getting back to a question I was asked before, um, we wanted to achieve uh, a frequency bending of one hertz, then we need to take one second of data, okay? And then I need to take a bunch of these one second segments, usually say 32 of them, just for sake of choosing a number. We perform a Fourier transform on each of them, and then we average those together, okay? Now in practice, in the data we use, there's two kinds of segments you can think about. Um, just for, I imagine, historical purposes, the gravitational wave uh, segments are given out in sizes of 4,096 seconds. So you can subdivide that. Uh, I don't know in my head the division between 4096 and 32, but I think that ends up with 128 or something like that. So you can, for example, get a good estimate of the PSD for 128 seconds of that data from a standard light segment. Someone else should do the division, okay? But I think that's right, right? which is one. So, so how much you want to use, right, is going to depend on, um, on, on the particular signal you're interested in. So for example, for binary neutron star signal, it may be active in the detector with a somewhat significant amplitude for 100 seconds or more. And so that's why you want to take a 128 second segment of data as your target analysis segment. And then in order to get a 
uh, power spectral density appropriate for it, you would take 128 second segments adjacent to it, sum them up in order to understand the noise properties at the time of the signal you're analyzing. Okay. That's sort of the rough picture. Any questions? Is there anything else you need to cover about PSDs? Okay. I'll show some example PSDs in a little bit. Great time management skills. Good job, Eric. All right, getting back to the search channel, linear filtering. So I said, how are we going to detect a signal in this data now that we have some understanding of the noise? The idea is that we're going to create a detection statistic, Z. And we create this detection statistic by a linear process of the data. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to convolve the data with some kernel. OK, this is our filter. And it is up to us to choose the kernel we want to use. OK, we can choose any kernel we want. But it turns out that if we restrict ourselves to this linear question, linear filtering, there is a uniquely good answer. And what we, in the end, want to do is we want to maximize the so-called SNR. Signal to noise ratio, okay, SNR signal to noise ratio. It's the ratio of the expectation value. And let me go ahead and define Z0 as just Z. So here's the idea. Imagine that at some arbitrary time, which we'll just set to zero by fiat, there is a signal in the data. I want to figure out what kernel, what filter I should use, such that Z at that time gives me my best chance of finding that signal in the data. The kernel that will work best is the one that maximizes the SNR, which is the ratio of the expectation value of that detection statistic, assuming there's a signal, divided by, that's the signal hypothesis, now we have to divide by the noise hypothesis. And the noise hypothesis is going to be the variance of Z, assuming there is no signal, just from noise, and then I have to take the square root to put these on here. So what does this mean? Basically, I'm trying to say, when there's a signal present, I want the amplitude of this thing on average to be a lot bigger than the standard deviation of the same quantifier when there's noise present. If that's not true, I'm never going to be able to distinguish signal from noise. So how do I maximize this? Well, uh, for this, for convenience, it's nice to define in the Fourier domain the filter having been rescaled by the PSD. We'll see why in just a second. So for convenience, I'm defining this <laughs> as, as what happens if I take K, multiply it by the PSD, and divide by two. Okay, so this is just this is just the filter still. Code encodes the filter, and now we just compute. We compute Z in the presence of the signal. And if I come up here and I plug this in, if I move from time to Fourier domain, I'm going to have to take the multiplication of the complex conjugate of the filter, right? We take the convolution and convolutions in time domain become multiplications of Fourier domain. So I have K star times the ensemble average of H plus N. Okay. Now, the ensemble average of H, there's nothing random about that. So I'm just actually going to be taking the ensemble average of N. But the ensemble average of N, we already have is zero. And so this is just going to be minus infinity to infinity, plugging in my expression for k. It's going to be g star, factor two comes outside, h tilde, or d, yeah, h tilde over Sn, yet. Okay. Now I can do a few tricks. I can use the fact that, like I said, these are both Fourier transforms of real functions. And so I can flip the frequency integrals. They go over minus infinity to infinity. I can exploit that to rewrite this in terms of the sum uh, from zero to infinity of g star h plus g h star divided by the PSD. And sometimes we also like to write this as, since this is just the real part of this multiplication, four times the real part from zero to infinity of g star h. So this actually kind of looks interesting. We see that this is an inner product in function space of these kinds of signals, but it's a noise-weighted inner product. What is it doing? It's saying that when the arm is, when the when the PSD is large, so in some sense the noise arm fluctuations are large, 
I'm going to downweigh the contribution to the internet. And where this is smallest, I get the most weight of this thing. Okay. And so we define this as our noise weighted inner product, and we typically write it as brackets GH and sort of this broad line notation or something like this. Any questions about that? Yes, sorry, you have no battery. But... On the computer? <laughs> <laughs> Is that even I'm very disappointed in you. So this is where this noise weighted inner product comes from. It may at this point not seem obvious that this was the right thing to do because I kind of brought that G out by fiat, but we will see in a moment that the same exact inner product appears when we calculate the other piece of the picture, the noise weighted variation. Okay, so the next piece so is maybe you said, but G is to. G is the filter. So I've just re rescaled the filter by a known function. It's not obvious why I did this. It happens that the noise weighted inner product pops out when I do this. But when I now compute the denominator, it will turn out that having made this assumption makes the denominator fall into exactly the same form. And so that motivates this definition of G. But G is just encoding the filter. It's G normalized in some way. No. It's just between zero and one. No. It can be anything. The normalization will, in, in, as, at the end of the derivation, we'll see that any normalization will work, as long as it's a constant. OK, so let's do the denominator next. Can we also change? Yes. Can we also see if it will be like a, like a heavy side? We might have a heavy side. You could do a, a heavy side. So you could use anything. And the question is, what functional form of G is best? You could use a heavy side filter. So for example, that's a natural guess. That's the band pass idea. Imagine you knew the signal you were looking for were concentrated in a narrow range of frequencies. Then you can see how this would benefit you to define G as being one in a narrow range of frequencies and zero elsewhere. Because when I do the product here of the filter against the data, outside of that narrow range of frequencies, we've got just noise. And so that noise will not be contributing to the expectation value in the signal, but it will contribute to the denominator. So a, a, a step function, sorry, a window function is a great idea to start with. If you know which frequency range to focus on, you're going to remove the noise that contributes to the denominator without hurting the numerator. The question is, what is the best thing to do ever? And it, it's answerable very easily. We're almost there. Because I have a Z squared here, I have two frequency integrals to do, df and df prime. And I'm already going to exploit this idea that I can flip the signs of one of the frequencies because they roll over both positive and negative frequencies. I can write k star f, k star minus f prime. I'll actually bring the ensemble average inside to hit. And this is under the noise hypothesis. So both copies of the data in this convolution are simply noise. So we have n of f and we have n of minus f ensemble average. But we've seen this already. This is one half the PSD times delta function f minus f prime because I can flip this for its Fourier, uh, for its Fourier, uh, sorry, for its complex conjugate. And in putting in my uh, definitions of k and also flipping this sign in order to remove this complex conjugate, what you get then resolving the delta function is from minus infinity to infinity, two copies of G, G star, G, two copies of S, uh, one is in the numerator from the PSD, the other two are in the denominators from the filter, renormalization. I get a factor of two, and I have a factor of a half. This is the factor of a half, the factor of two squared became one from each copy of the filter. Okay, but look at this, canceling these out, this is going to be equal to, uh, did I already miss uh no, I didn't. <coughs> These cancel to give me a two. I can then use the fact that the negative and positive frequencies are the same as each other using the complex conjugation trick to fold this at the expense of another power of two. And we have g squared over Sn, having canceled one of these two. 
So the whole point of defining that normalization of the filter is so that both of these two calculations give you exactly the same looking thing at the end. I haven't lost any generality, but we see that the denominator is the inner product of G with itself. And so the SNR is equal to now GH over GG square root. And this should be very familiar. This is nothing more than the inner product of a unit vector, another vector. And now I ask you the question, what vector gives you the maximum inner product with another vector? What's that? Itself, itself. So we see that G should simply be proportional to H and I wanna write a constant proportionality just to emphasize it can't be frequency dependent. Yes. Does that mean that this will essentially be theoretical or yes. the way possible? Yes. The BAT filter is the MAT filter. The MAT filter involves taking the thing you are looking for, taking its Fourier transform, and convolving with the data, or leaving it in time and then convolving with the data after having accounted for the noise. And that's the best you can ever do with linear processes, with linear steps. So it's a remarkable thing. This is why. Modeling is such a key part of gravitation with data analysis. It's not just so we can measure the parameters. Our most sensitive searches also rely on an accurate theoretical prediction so that we can create a set of templates to search against the data. This G doesn't depend on the noise properties, but only on H. Only on stationary and ergodicity. So everything I did here assumes stationary and ergodicity. G does depend on the noise properties in the following sense. Remember that K had to be defined using the PSD. And similarly, the noise-weighted inner product involves knowing the PSD. But you can calculate the PSD, right? So long as there are times where your data doesn't have a signal in it, I can analyze that, compute the PSD via these discrete Fourier transforms, define my inner product, and I'm ready to go. Okay. That is a harder question. So one of the active areas of research is to understand how to do a good job when we have overlapping signals. It turns out that if one signal, these signals occupy um, sort of compact regions in time frequency space. So you saw this spectrogram in Maria's plot, and I think Patricia might talk about them in the hands-on in the hands-on thing tomorrow. Um, you can do a time frequency transform of these things. You see that they sort of exist in a compact domain. It turns out that if two signals sort of live in different parts of time frequency space, then they tend not to have a very strong inner product. There's some caveats here. Depends on, you have to normalize things properly. And so even when signals overlap somewhat, you can kind of still do the same thing. If they overlap strongly, you're in trouble. And so this is something people have to think about for Cosmic Explorer, Einstein Telescope, LISA, when we have many overlapping signals. Do you need this already to just figure out if there is a gravitational wave signal? Yes. Yes. So you just take a bunch of data and then you. Yeah, I'll go. I'll go into that. I'll go into that in just a second. Absolutely. This is what we do. Yes. So let's look at some examples. So white noise. It's the simplest case. White noise. The noise process is completely uncorrelated from time to time to time. So the noise at a given time is drawn from, so the squiggle means drawn from, this is a random number drawn from, the distribution. We typically use an N for a normal distribution uh, with, some, with some standard deviation sigma. And it's totally uncorrelated in time. So even in time, N of T, N of T prime is always equal to a delta function. So that's the easiest noise, okay? That's just white noise. Closely related to white noise is color Gaussian noise. The idea with color Gaussian noise is it's exactly like white noise, except in the frequency domain. Color Gaussian noise is best understood in the frequency domain, where every single n at a given f is drawn from a Gaussian, but a different Gaussian. It's a Gaussian with a different variance from frequency to frequency to frequency. So in particular, this is drawn from a normal distribution, zero mean, and with some sigma. And that sigma i is related, of course, to the PSD because we have an intuition now that the PSD is related to the variance 
of our noise up to factors of the thinning that we're using. And this is actually really useful and important because the cool thing about colored Gaussian noise is let's say I have a frequency vector. So we have to remember that we've got a discrete set of values in our data, right? It's actually not a continuous function. It's a function which has been evaluated at a discrete set of points. So sometimes it's useful to think of these as like a sequence of points or a vector. And I can ask, given a certain particular noise realization, a certain vector of noise, that is associated with some amount of time of the signal, what is the probability that I get that particular noise realization? So I see some noise in my data, I can ask, what was the probability of getting that noise? Well, it's just the product of these Gaussians in the Fourier domain. And so you end up with this is proportional to the product of a bunch of Gaussians, exponential, so here, yes. Yes. So, I shall figure out what just happened. Oh, this is so annoying because it's not on the right side. Uh, Zoom, why do you do this? This is a problem I've never experienced before. Zoom rebellion. Oh, is it running out of power? Okay, it's not charging. Um, you need to charge too much. Yeah, if has a better charger, that looks great. Yeah, perfect. This will actually work. That's perfect. Okay, now, oh my gosh, what? <laughs> All right, if you'll excuse me for privacy, I'm going <laughs> to. I'm going to go into my email and recover this. Um, does this mean that we need to? No, the Zoom's meeting still recording, right? So we're okay. I just need to click this link, launch Zoom again, launch Zoom again. You would not believe the large number of things that just went wrong on my laptop. Google crashed. My browser crashed. Okay, with Ubuntu, you would not have that. <laughs> with Ubuntu, I would never have gotten to this point of uh, using an iPad with the uh, with Zoom uh, in order to entertain you all with my phone. Most likely. That's better. I'm promising you I'm going to Yeah. Thank you for reminding me of the final and most important step. <laughs> Bigger can. I don't to do that. Okay. All right. Now, as we were saying, this is going to be a product of Gaussians over this vector of noise values. And the cool thing is then we get that this is the sum over um, n squared, right? The values divided by their variances. But their variances, I already wrote down above, it's going to be Sn uh, times a factor of 2 up here uh, and a delta f here. And that's nothing more than the thing we just saw, because I have to sum over positive and negative frequencies. 
This is nothing more than the exponential of minus one half the product of the noise vector with itself. So I can actually easily compute the probability that I get a given realization of the noise, and that's critical for parameter estimation. Now, this is what a typical PSD, actually, this is the ASD. So this here is the ASD. Let me come sideways. This is the ASD, which is the amplitude spectral density. We like the amplitude spectral density because it has the same scale of values as the signals themselves. Remember, the PSD is like the noise square. So the ASD is just the square root of the PSD. And that's why it has this bizarre one over per root per its units. And you can use the ASD for certain tricks in data analysis, but mostly we like to look at it because it's more intuitive. You can put signals on the same scale very easily. Okay, so this is live, this is the noise curve of, right, uh, the design noise curve gravitational wave detector. You can see that above a thousand hertz, the noise in the detector begins to rise quickly. This is a log log plot, right? So we're going up as a power law. This is due to shot noise, fundamental quantum mechanical effect. The, the less time you average over, the fewer photons are being measured in the detector and you have more random fluctuations due to not having counted enough photons, okay? Uh, at the lowest frequencies, we have a whole pile of noise versus conspiring together. Seismic noise is just the ground motion, which is being screened by active seismic isolation elements and the fact that we hang the mirrors and the detectors on quadruple pendula. Uh, but there's other subtle things that are quite difficult. So for example, gravity gradient noise, which also begins to dominate at low frequencies, is particularly nasty because that is simply the Newtonian gravitational tugging on the mirrors due to movement of the ground itself. So if a, if a seismic wave moves under the detectors, it compresses and decompresses the actual ground itself. There's a slight fluctuation in density. The Newtonian gravitational tug is a noise source that for future detectors actually has to be dealt with. Okay, it can't be screened, but you can measure it and subtract it. Okay, and then here, this blue line is quantum noise thing. This is because actually the full quantum effect of the detector is not just shot noise, it's actually sort of a Heisenberg uncertainty competition between shot noise and radiation pressure noise. Okay, I can get rid of shot noise by increasing the number of photons in the detector. On the other hand, with more photons in the detector, I'm pushing on the mirrors harder. And quantum mechanical fluctuations in the amplitude of the, of the photons of the laser beams in the detector result in harder pushes on the mirrors. So there's actually this competition and at low frequencies, it's the radiation pressure that's the worst factor. At high frequencies, it's the shot noise that's a factor. They come together here. And this curve, up to some details, is known as the standard quantum limit, because it's hard to push this uh, further. You have to sort of, uh, uh, if let's say I wanted to lower the shot noise, I could push this down, but I would push this up. Okay, so that's a challenge that people have to face. And then finally, right where we're most sensitive, the um, thermal motion of the mirror coatings is an issue. Any questions about noise or what this plot means? Hopefully now we know what this plot is telling us. This is the standard deviation of the factors of the square root frequency, square root frequency bins. This is the standard deviation of the noise in each frequency. Yeah. So this, so right, so the, this PFD is for colored Gaussian noise. So the reason why we focus on colored Gaussian noise, and I, I guess I didn't say this, uh, is that the noise in the detectors is assumed to be colored Gaussian noise, okay? And, and it roughly is, right? Um, but this is in fact the PSD for a colored Gaussian process. So at each given frequency, the noise is Gaussian, but it's Gaussian with a different variance from frequency to frequency to frequency. So sometimes the noise is stronger and sometimes less. All right. So previously you were saying Measuring the noise by with like averaging over time, etc. It was all all like data driven. Now we want the understanding of the, where the noise comes from. Oh, good, good question. So um, we do do data driven. We actually measure these things. I'll show a real noise curve in just a second. But of course, when designing the detectors, you had to un we had to understand not we other people had to understand how bad the noise could be, and if we could actually achieve low enough noise levels to measure realistic gravitational wave sources. So there's a huge 
industry and field of designing these interferometers and figuring out what the sources of noise were. And famously, Ray Weiss in the uh, 70s wrote down as part of his tenure packet, like a proposal for a gravitational wave interferometer. And at the time, just from fundamental principles, derived most of these noise curve, most of these contributions to the noise curve, and was able to see that this would be a feasible project. Uh, and so, so this is theoretical, but then we can measure it as well. Uh, and I'll get to that now. So I'm basically out of time, but I'm going to hold you here anyway, uh, because we still haven't talked about parameter estimation, but we will. Um, what is the real challenge here? I talked to you about the naive challenge, mostly as a way of motivating this noise weighted in a product you're seeing everywhere, explain to you what a PSD is, and make you understand the idea of mesh filtering. But the problem is mesh filtering, you need to know the signal. We don't know the signal, because the signal, I mean the actual exact signal, okay? Or something pretty close to it, okay? But we don't know if it's a 10 solar mass binary or 100 solar mass binary a priori. We don't know what time the signal's gonna commence. What do we do? Well, we scan over the parameter space. We need a large number of model predictions, and we need to try each against the data and find the best one. Okay. So for example, scanning over time is easy. We just go back to the fact that, remember, I defined Z at time equals zero when I knew the thing was a time equals zero. Well, if it's not a time equals zero, you just insert a time delay factor into the same inner product. And this defines a detection statistic that as we watch it over time, we'll sort of rumble around, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, jump up, where there's potentially a signal and come back down. Now, of course, random, random noise will cause this to jump sometimes. So what you want to do is figure out what threshold to set such that if this jumps up high enough, you know that that is very unlikely to have happened with noise, and that becomes a detection candidate. We also don't know the phase of the signal. These are, these are sinusoidal signals, so they involve some arbitrary phase. But this is particularly easy to handle. You just go ahead and you use two templates simultaneously. You use one template that's cosine light. Use another template that's just pi over two rotated, so a sine length template, and we combine them with a, with an imaginary unit, so that we now have a complex uh, h that we're going to run against the data. And this is no longer just I don't take the real part of this anymore. I let this be complex, and its absolute value automatically selects out the best combination of these two that you could have possibly had. So this maximizes over the relative phase. And so we actually scan Z over the data and we take its absolute value. This handles the unknown time and phase. But we also have to maximize over the intrinsic parameter. So for example, the masses and the spins of the black holes. So what do we do? Well, we tile, quote unquote, parameter space. So this is an example of a template bank that's used by one of the searches. We're just seeing a cut of the template bank in M1 and M2. And each of these tiny dots represents one template, right? At that M1 and M2, we have a signal, and we're going to try that signal against the data. And we're going to try all these signals against the data. We're going to scan all of them across the data. And at any given time, we figure out which one is creating the highest Z value, the highest detection statistic. Then we record that, and then we try to figure out how significant was that compared to the noise. At the moment, these template banks only tile in four dimensions two masses and the two aligned components of the spin. That means we're not using full physics in our searches yet. Okay, We're using systems that you can think about either as we're neglecting precession effects or we're assuming there is no precession in the binaries. Yes? How long does it usually take to test against the signal? I mean, these correlations are very fast, but you have to do these template banks are on the order of uh, hundreds of thousands of templates and you have to scan them across the entire data. So these are computationally very expensive things to do. Um, and they take, I don't know the order of magnitude, how many CPU hours, but they're major calculations. So does that mean that in practice you will keep that data forever? Because at some point you might just generate the, the domain form. We, we do keep the data forever. So the data itself is fairly lightweight. It's a single time series over like a year. It's not a lot of data. And so we keep and distribute the data to everyone. Ah, so There's... Not really big, 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 big. No, the processing of the data is a big computational effort. The data itself is very lightweight. Okay. But this is in balance in parallel. It's very balanced. Yeah, so this, yeah. this, 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 this oh. Yeah. Yes. I didn't want to say something about how the What's the criteria? I don't want to talk about that. Okay. Um, so 
obviously there are gaps here. So you need to figure out how to tile the space such that if the signal actually arrives in one of these gaps, it is close enough in terms of this inner product. So it's dot product with anything in a gap is close enough that we don't lose too much likelihood of finding that signal. We typically define this idea of mismatch, which you've already seen, mismatch, MM. equals one minus the inner product, and I'll actually need to leave a little bit of space, one minus the inner product of H1 hat, H2 hat. So this measures uh, how well H1 and H2 agree with each other. The inner product is taking their dot product, but actually since we generally don't care about the time and the phase, we want to maximize their inner product over time shifts and phase shifts. So this here is called the match. And it's typically close to one when the things agree well. So we subtract it from one in order to get the so-called mismatch. Usually the mismatch of these template things between the templates and the spaces in between is, point, is 0 0.01 or 0 0.02. And that gives us a pretty good coverage. So yeah, you, said, you, want, you want to do this in real time, right? Is, uh, it doesn't have to be in real time, but we want to do it in real time in practice because if a binary neutron star comes in, we want to alert astronomers right away that there is potentially a binary neutron star merger and also give them an estimate of where we think it was in the sky. So the, the, the connections to astronomy have put on us the requirement that we be able to do these things in near real time. But if it weren't for astronomers, this could all happen whenever. Traditional astronomers. Traditional astronomers. We are also astronomers now. We are also astronomers. Actually, even more specifically, transient astronomers, right? I mean, other kinds of astronomers also don't need to do things tonight. Right? My question was going to be okay, so then you want to be close to real time, but do you repeat it? We do. So typically there's an online pass and there's an offline pass, and then the data is given out to the external world and external communities also do their own searches. And so all of the LIGO data now has been searched many times by multiple groups with different flavors of search. And that is helpful because the search techniques advance and we do uncover new candidates that were not discovered before. But on the flip side, you always have this like trials factor. If I run a slightly different search many times, I'm going to get fictitious candidates occasionally just by chance. And so people aren't actually penalizing their searches properly most of the time. The, in the LBK, we try to adopt a conservative penalty because we run multiple searches simultaneously. Um, but that's something to keep in mind is that the, there, is, there is a penalty uh, that one should apply mentally. It's not very large, but it's there. Probably about a password. Yeah. You probably will. About a password. Uh, yes. really don't want, I really don't want to. Uh, he gives a one minor, uh, so I'll, I'll do PE. But what's the reality check? Um, these PSDs, they vary over time, so they're not actually stationary. Okay, so that's one challenge. So we have to regularly update them. Another challenge is the noise is not even close to Gaussian. Uh, it's Gaussian plus a population of these instrumental artifacts known as glitches which unfortunately look a lot like gravitational waves. So the simple estimates you can do for how high your threshold should be on the detection statistic fail if you do those estimates assuming Gaussian noise. So instead you have to actually look at your real background using your real search. And all searches have designed some way of improving the detection statistic over that optimal match filter using some kind of nonlinear processing of the data, okay? And for instance, the IAS group calls this vetoing. And you can see here that these are the number of triggers that hit some uh, SNRs. This would be your detection statistic, the SNR that I talked about before. But there's this huge tail at really high SNRs. None of these are real. They're all glitches. And so if you apply the correct procedures to identify and remove the glitches or to penalize them in your search, you get a much more Gaussian distribution of, of uh, events. Okay. Um, parameter estimation, I'll do in one line. So we said that E minus H is the noise. So in parameter estimation, one thing we didn't need to know is the likelihood of, giving, of getting a certain realization of the data, assuming that the data contains a signal with a set of parameters theta. So theta is our collection of parameters, M1, M2, and so on, that describe the binary. And in order to write down this likelihood, we rely on this fact that if I assume there is a certain signal with some parameters theta in the data, then by definition, 
D minus H of theta must be equal to the noise realization that made that data look like it did. But that means that this likelihood is equal to the probability of the noise realization given that H of theta is in the data. And we saw before that that was proportional to the exponential of minus one half, the inner product of N with itself. But that's just equal to the exponential minus one half, the data minus the proposed signal squared. Okay, so that's why it's worth dwelling on Gaussian colored noise for a little while. It gives us our likelihood function. And evaluating this likelihood function is what tells us how likely it is that a given signal was in the data. That's actually not what we care about. What we want is something known as a posterior distribution. It's a slight twist on the same question. It's the question of what is the probability that an event with a given set of parameters was in the data? Not the probability that I get that data if there really was a signal in there, but the other way around, because this is a measurement of the parameters. We call these posteriors. But it's a probabilistic measurement. I actually get a full distribution of probability across all of the possibilities of what could have been in the body. And this is an example of the 2D marginalization. So I have to compress the posteriors down into a 2D plane by integrating out all the other possible properties of the binary. We can see that this is a probability distribution of the combination of masses that produce GW15914. And it's these distributions that we actually want to measure. And Bayes theorem gives us our way of doing it. Bayes theorem tells us that I can get this probability from my likelihood, provided that I also, also multiply by the a priori probability that those that the that the binary could have had those parameters at all, divided by a certain normalization factor. That can be difficult to do. Okay, so if you have the ability to evaluate this likelihood, and we do, provided we have a model for the signal, we can compute by brute force these posteriors. Should I stop now, or should I take two more minutes? Okay. Any questions about this picture before I take those two minutes? What's the problem with this picture? Say this like 15 dimensional. If I wanted to describe those posterior probabilities for you in 15 dimensions, you might say, oh, grid them up. 10 points in each dimension. <laughs> 10 to the 15 evaluations, it will never be done. Okay? It cannot be done. Okay? Now it'd be a pretty crummy, coarse grained evaluation of the likelihood of the posteriors. Okay? So what do we do in practice? So in practice, we need to sample. The idea is that what we really do is instead of trying to evaluate this across some grid or even some adapted grid, although there are some exceptions, what we really try to provide to the community and in our papers is a collection of samples indexed by I, which are drawn from, independently drawn from the posteriors. So instead of giving the probability distribution, I give you draws from the probability distribution. And this is what you really want, actually. Because let's say you wanted to take the expectation value of say the mass, so the mean value of the mass of the primary in the system, the heavier object in the system. This is going to be M1 times this posterior probability distribution integrated over all of the parameters. But if I've given you a collection of draws from the probability distribution, you can use Monte Carlo integration to estimate this as just the simple sum of the samples of that particular value. So anything you want to do with the data, whether it's compute means or variances of the parameters or higher moments of the distribution or, a or covariances, anything at all, you can do with the samples via Monte Carlo summation. And so the question then is how do we get the samples? So sampling is itself, of course, a huge field of algorithms and, and mathematics. Um, but the nice thing is that there's a large number of Monte Carlo methods that allow us to draw these samples and the really great thing is that they allow us to draw these samples even if you don't know the normalization of this thing. And that's important because we might know the normalization of L and we might know the normalization of our prior, but we don't know the normalization of this probability distribution unless I can do the full integral of this thing to compute the normalization factor. This is known as the evidence for those that 
have some familiarity, familiarity with Bayesian methods. So you can't calculate this most of the time. And that's kind of problematic if you think about trying to evaluate this thing. But it turns out that Monte Carlo methods uh, don't care. Okay, so if I scroll down to this picture, let me give you an example of the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, which is the simplest idea. The idea is we're going to have a random walker, a chain. It's going to start at point one, it's going to jump, then it jumps again, then it jumps again, then it jumps again, and it randomly executes a walk. And provided that the walker spends time or iterations where the probability distribution is largest, then over time, this random walk becomes a collection of samples, which are fair draws from the distribution. Okay, And so the simple metropolis Hastings algorithm is as follows. One, we start at theta one, we evaluate that the density of the points are the proxy of the video. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So we start at theta one, and now we need to propose a jump to two. So we propose theta two drawn from some other distribution that depends only on theta one. Okay. So MCMC is Markov chain Monte Carlo. This is this algorithm. Markov means the process of walking should only depend on where you were the last step, not the step before, just the last step. So this probability distribution for how I jump can only depend on where I am and where I want to go. That's the Markov part of this. Okay. This Q can be anything. Okay. And choosing Q carefully is part of the art of sampling well. Okay. And it can depend on what problem, it can depend on your problem what Q is best. Usually, you want this Q to be symmetric in its arguments. That's detailed balance, and it just happens to make the algorithm simple. So provided that this Q is symmetric in its arguments, the idea is I propose a jump, I draw a point from this distribution. It could be a big Gaussian. It just has to be easy to draw. From. Then I look at that point, and I compute the ratio of probabilities, the probability of the posterior at the proposed point, and I divide it by the probability of the point I'm sitting at. And that's why the normalization is not important. The normalization of the posterior is the same in numerator and denominator, and it cancels out. Okay? And then you accept the jump sometimes. You accept the jump with probability, the minimum, of either one or the ratio. So what does this mean? If the new point is a higher probability point, you always accept it. You always jump to a higher probability point. But sometimes you allow yourself that the next proposal after two might even jump over here. Because that, that proposal depends on Q, which doesn't know anything about the posterior you're trying to explore. So it's very easy to say, go over here now to three. Now, I will sometimes jump to three, even though it is less probable. You just have to do it with a probability equal to the ratio. So the less probable it is, the less likely I make a jump. It turns out that if this is your algorithm, then over a large enough period of time, the density of these steps will match the probability distribution, and this chain will itself be a set of fair draws from the theory. Okay? It's like magic, and it is extremely efficient in higher numbers of dimensions. Had a lot of caveats subtly woven into those signs. They may look wrong on the surface. Is it proven that in the limit of infinite sampling? Yes. You do recover the. Yeah, that's what's actually proven, and that's the problem. It's in the limit of infinite sampling. So there's a lot of nice mathematical guarantees about Monte Carlo methods, and none of them are practical guarantees. Okay. Right, that's why it's insufficiently long, and so on and so forth. And so this is one way that you could draw samples. All you need to be able to do is evaluate the light. And that's going to be the end of my talk, so I can take questions. Can you uh, estimate how the, the, the mismatch between the, the, the few new uh, and jumps? Can you estimate how it is, how well it is? Like, yeah, so the Monte Carlo error in any computation you do, you know that it scales as 1 over square root n, where n is the number of samples you've collected. Okay, so was that your question about the number of samples or? No, oh, because you're, you're talking about um, this being um, a good way to find the distribution on the limited number. Good. Uh, yeah. Infinite number of jumps, so can you estimate how wrong? Yeah, there, there are ways. I don't know what the mathematical theorems are, but in practice, what we do is that in, the re in reality, we have a finite number of these steps. And they're not independent, right? The goal is to have independence, and it's only independent if I take a long enough 
Walker and consider all of them in collective. But if I have, let's say, a thousand steps, those are not independent of each other. And so the reality is what you do the following. You compute the correlation. You compute the correlation length tau of the process of the chain. This tells me how far down the chain I have to move before I achieve a sample that has forgotten where it came from. Those are now two independent samples from the distribution. And so what we typically do is we compute this out of well, what some people do, not all data analysis does this. I think, for example, in cosmology, I don't think they, I don't think they reduce their chains necessarily. Um, you, what you can do is given the chain, you can compute this length and then you can decimate your chain by going through and picking every tau sample. Right, so if the length is 10 samples, you take every 10th sample, and those are now more independent than you had before. And this helps guarantee that you know that you have a certain number of independent samples, and then you need to just check to see if that number is large enough for accurate Monte Carlo uh, estimates. And just, I just realized that I think the uh, poor Zoom folks are stuck on my screen from a long time ago. Sorry. Yes. Um, what do you do in practice with this part of my challenge to your fit for tag to your events? It'll work, right? So it can be hard. Um, given sufficiently long time, it will jump to the next max. So this is this is getting into the details, which I'm happy to talk about, although we're over time. So stop me if someone doesn't want to hear the details. One of the challenges is that you might walk here for a very long time. And it might take a very long time to jump to the other region. So it's very possible that we have multimodal posteriors, posteriors where multiple regions are favored, but they're kind of disconnected, or the likelihood or the probability between them is low. Well, the Markov chain guarantees that eventually you'll take an unlikely jump over to here, and then you're happy again, right? Because you can then you'll be happy to explore this region for a while. Um, but that can sometimes take a long time. So multimodal posteriors are famously challenging to sample. And so people have come up with dedicated algorithms to do this. So in the Monte Carlo world, the classic way to fix this is known as tempering. You basically actually sample a sequence of problems. And what you do is you sample not just the true problem, but you also quote unquote warm up the distribution by applying a Boltzmann factor to the probability distribution, which has the effect of joining the chains together. So with some temperature T, these chains now join together and the water can move across the maximum more easily. And then there's an algorithm for exchanging between the different temperatures, exchanging information, which allows the true walker to do a better job of jumping from, from one to another. There's also, um, there's also a, a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and other methods that try to help you explore faster. I don't think Hamiltonian Monte Carlo helps with the multimodality, but people have specialized algorithms to try to address this. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, if you jump, uh, if you use this uh, very unproductivity, uh, you can go into this path with the length, still, you might be very trying to find some sample some description, how to make it to, to be, I don't know, 10% of something like that. So I think what one knows in general is, again, if you were truly drawing independent samples and you want to compute some moments or other properties of your distribution, you know that those scale with one per square root of n, but you don't know the coefficient of that scaling because it depends on the problem. So sometimes you could be in trouble, but in general, you know at least how it improves by collecting more samples. But it is still true that just because I do everything I just said and I, and I thin the chains and I do everything I'm supposed to do, you may have missed a region of high probability. It is possible. And this is why data analysis is sort of a holistic endeavor. You have to know a little bit about your model and what to expect in terms of the posterior distribution. You have to study your results and think about them and check them and maybe rerun them with different settings if you think this sampling run didn't really sample well. And there are ways of knowing that, right? Of looking at it and seeing that the results are poor or computing autocorrelation lengths, and seeing that they're not converging, or you do multiple independent runs, which we typically do all the time, and make sure that they all agree with each other. That's another good check. Other questions?
All right, well, I'm over time, but I'm here till Friday only. So come talk to me if you have other questions. And thank you so much. We need to go save on the power source. But that's even more than the same stage. Yeah, maybe it should have been the same thing. I had read online that in Brazil, they were both European and non-European style.